compared to one year ago. My goal is to continue running my independent media outlet and create even more quality content. So I've created a Patreon account. If you'd like to become a supporter, simply make a pledge. Once we reach our $2,000 a month goal, I will create an exclusive podcast featuring one of you. Yes, I will be interviewing one Patreon subscriber per month and let them tell their own story of how they woke up to the reality of our fraudulent financial system and the importance of owning sound money. I want to build a community of like-minded individuals. If you can make a monetary pledge to help Finance and Liberty, then awesome. Go to patreon.com slash finance and liberty and pledge as little as $1 per month. I understand that not everyone can pay for extra content, and I want to make the community open to everyone. So I will be sending out the special monthly podcasts in the Finance and Liberty free newsletter as well. So if you don't have any funds to pledge, simply go to financeandliberty.com or click here to sign up for the Finance and Liberty newsletter. Hey everyone, this is Elijah Johnson with financeandliberty.com. And back with us today is Dr. Jim Willie, editor of the Hattrick Letter found on goldenjackass.com. Jim, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, it's a pleasure being here. I, uh, I have to caution people that I'm, I'm getting over a, a pretty nasty flu with some lung congestion and problems there, a lot of coughing. And uh, please bear with me, though. There'll, there'll be some breaks where I have to cough, and that's the way it is right now and I'm trying to get over this it's been over a week I had viewers submit questions today and the first couple viewers questions are on Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies because we've seen them just people just piling into Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies recently Bitcoin you know around all-time highs and this viewer is wanting to know if you agree with Rob Kirby that the strong increase in cryptocurrencies and you know the rush into Bitcoin represents the final demise of fiat currencies, particularly the dollar. Yes, I do. I agree with that assessment. Um, I think it's, I, I don't think that adequately summarizes all of Rob's thoughts on that matter. Uh, let me add to, to his point. <clears throat> to begin with, the Bitcoin seems to be the flagship that is running uh, front and center among all the cryptocurrencies. Uh, it, it uses the blockchain encryption technology, uh, which I believe will become more important in other ways. Now, I mean more important than, than you know, funds transactions, funds movement. But the blockchain is gonna become extremely important for business to business communications like, for instance, I'll get back to Rob's point, but I, this is a very important issue, the blockchain. If companies want to send, say, uh, schematics on a product design or you know, rather detailed description of, of characteristics of a new product, uh, this is very sensitive, and they will do it with the encryption of blockchain. If they want to send... Uh, to another company like interested in an acquisition. Uh, a lot of information, say, for future strategy, one-year plan and three-year plan. Uh, it's very sensitive, and they'll transmit it by means of blockchain. If they want to send uh, other information like, say, stock options and uh, planned uh, personnel changes, uh, planned uh, contracts for consultants and other sensitive information one company to another they'll use blockchain if they want to use, if they want to move across uh, say uh, titles for property and uh, bids and things like that uh, the plot plans of properties whether they're small or large they'll be doing it with blockchain so we're, we're moving now to an area where not just sensitive funds movement to be done in a secure way, like with Bitcoin, it'll be for a movement of very important, uh, you know, kind of classified information at the corporate level. Okay. When Rob mentions that this is uh, the final uh, step, final phase for the dollar, I agree completely. And uh, almost everybody on my little jackass gang of colleagues feels pretty much the same way. But there's, there's more to this. Um, 
I don't. Okay, I've got some problems with the Bitcoin and the cryptos. I got here's my biggest problem, Elijah, and that is, what is the actual step? What is the procedure for creating, say, a Bitcoin? I'm not really sure about that. Uh, I also wonder what is the exact type of unit <clears throat> for a Bitcoin? What is it? And all I can hear of it, all I can, all I hear, all I can comprehend is that it's a unit of electronic work. But it seems to be paid in paper fiat currency like a dollar. Okay, so <clears throat> why is this seeming close end fund running up so much? It's because it's got limited supply, for which I don't comprehend fully, and rising demand, which is pushing its price up, up, up. All right. Here's the big question for the day regarding cryptos. Are the powers that be, like the Wall Street banks and central banks, London banks, and key Western European banks, are they making an agreement? to let Bitcoin and others rise, 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 so that <clears throat> they will be vulnerable. Because one question I keep having a, a great deal of difficulty getting a good answer for is, what's the relationship between Bitcoin and gold? And all I can comprehend is none, none at all. Um, so I don't know how it's mined, I don't know how the supply comes, and I don't know what its basis is, and it's, I know it's not related to gold. So what the hell is it? I don't know exactly. I'm honest about this. So I don't know what this is exactly all about, except that it seems like, given its closed-end nature, like a closed-end fund, the powers that be might be allowing it to rise so that they can slam it and smash it with the first introduction of a gold-backed cryptocurrency. China's talking about it. <clears throat> the Fed is talking about it with, I think, Fedcoin. I'm not exactly sure about the gold basis of that. Uh, and there are other entries that might become gold-backed. So, if they let the Bitcoin group go up, 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 and then there's an introduction of a gold-backed Bitcoin type, I think we're going to see a rather significant decline in the crypto values. Uh, and I'm not really sure how the value of a crypto is determined. So we're, we're dealing with, you know, very murky, competitive type of currency, uh, which has secure transferability. One of the biggest things the central bank crowd hates about Bitcoin is its transferability across international lines, completely out of the purview of the banking system of SWIFT and you know the Federal Reserve monitoring of, of such. So we've got the evolution and development of something that's very counteractive uh, to the currency system right now. And they don't like it a bit. Not that play on words for Bitcoin, but they don't like it at all. It, it's out of their control. So I think they're going to try to smash it somehow. But I think they're going to fail. Um, the big, the big event coming is introduction of gold-backed cryptocurrencies, where there will no longer be a question: Well, what is its unit of value? And you won't say a unit of electronic work. You'll say it's a gold coin with some associated work related to that. <clears throat> the voice has an opinion on this. You know, he, he's, uh, he's kind of old school when it comes to money. He believes in gold and not in paper. But Bitcoin is uh, it's taking the world by storm. And it's not a phony unit and it's a very reliable transferability method but the voice believes very clearly that blockchain technology which is the gut of bitcoin 
will be very much central to the gold trade note which kills the dollar and the treasury bill for a trade payment potential. That's how important this is going to be when you get your first entry of a gold-backed cryptocurrency. It can then be immediately used in trade payment. And that's when the Treasury bill will just go to the wayside. And it'll grow and grow and grow because they'll know that the unit of payment is real, whereas the unit of a Treasury bill is bullshit. The U.S. and the Fed are printing, I believe, very firmly three to ten trillion dollars a month not the advertised 40 60 80 billion a month they're printing tremendous amounts in the trillions every month to cover their derivative books to make sure the interest rate swap derivative is active and prevents a treasury bond default because there are almost no buyers and there's a trillion to maybe trillion and a half every year do for federal and federal deficit and trade deficit the public numbers on central bank participation for uh, uh, QE they're absolute nonsense and lies they're off by a factor of 10 15 or 20 so I'm looking forward to transition here slightly I'm looking forward to the day when we get some gold backing for cryptos because that will sort out the mom and pop cryptos from the legitimate ones. And I'm coming to learn from some, uh, some of my minor study that one of the biggest issues regarding a valid cryptocurrency is its efficiency in usage. And they're not all the same. Some might have half the amount of energy uh, what's the word, consumed or used in order to facilitate from end to end, point to point, a transaction. And the ones that do it more efficiently are going to be the winners. It's kind of, kind of try to think of it in terms of a, a, a radical new vehicle. You could think of a, you know, a nifty new kind of truck or don't, don't worry about its power system. But the issue is how much energy is required to get, say, from San Francisco to Los Angeles. How much energy is required to go from New York to London? Okay, with this new kind of vehicle that doesn't have wheels, okay? If one crypto uses half the amount of energy to cross the Atlantic Ocean, it's gonna tend to win in the bigger battles that come that are important because their, their fees might be lower. So right now, if you get a dollar transfer from New York to a London bank, it's a, <clears throat> a certain pricing structure for making the move, making the transfer, completing it. Well, if, if certain other transfer mechanisms are more efficient, maybe their cost will be half as much. If it's half as much, it's going to be a winner because it's going to bring about lower transfer costs for its users. Before we move off of Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies, um, this viewer is wanting to know, do you think central banks will decide to confiscate Bitcoin accounts and other cryptocurrencies in the future economic collapse as an alternative to bank account bail-ins and, and confiscation of gold and silver? Could a cryptocurrency confiscation be touted by governments as a pretext to an effective solution for abating terrorists, black market and illegal transaction activity? Whenever I hear the question or the threat of confiscation, I immediately react in the same way. Whether it's about confiscation of gold, confiscation of weapons, uh, confiscation of silver, whatever. Um, can they confiscate? Could they really? I don't think so. If they could have confiscated gold coins and silver coins, would they not have done so already? Do they not confiscate uh, weapons, guns, rifles, uh, ammunition? Do they not confiscate these because they can't? Because they don't want the reaction, which might be police 
being shot dead from rooftops. Uh, I believe they don't confiscate because they cannot. Uh, I don't think Bitcoin can be confiscated. Furthermore, I think the chances of confiscating gold are 10 times greater than confiscating Bitcoin. Let me put that the other way around. It is 10 times more difficult to confiscate Bitcoins than confiscating gold and silver coins. They, they won't do it because they can't. I'm not even sure what it means to confiscate a Bitcoin. Won't it just move to another location? Bitcoin is like, you know, an armada of cockroaches that these son of a bitch bankers cannot control. So don't worry about confiscation of Bitcoin. Be more concerned about chemtrails, GMO foods, contaminated water, laced atmosphere with viruses. That should be your concern. I'm wondering if this virus that I have, ha I'm having difficulty getting rid of for the last 10 days, I'm wondering if it's from some stinking ass chemtrail. I'm not worried about them confiscating my bitcoins. I'm more worried about them killing us from the air and the water. I hope my uh, passion answers partly the question. You're concerned about the wrong things. You should be concerned about what you're drinking in your water and the bullshit they're putting in your food chain. They can't touch Bitcoin. Why do you think Fedcoin is going to be a possible alternative? Because they can't remove it. So they're going to join it and try to contaminate the good ones. It's not going to work. It's just not going to work. As soon as you get a gold-backed Bitcoin, gold-backed cryptocurrency, <clears throat> just start the countdown. It's game over. So I think Bitcoin is serving something as a proxy uh, for currency in a very constructive manner. But once it turns into a gold-backed crypto, the entire game changes. Uh, if, if Russia and China came out with a gold-backed currency, the, the, the yuan and uh, ruble, you think that would have an effect on the dollar? Hell yeah! So when there's a gold-backed cryptocurrency being launched, or eight of them, one from every continent, you think it'll have an effect on the shabby cryptos? Yeah, but it's going to be worse than that. It's going to be an effect on all the paper forex currencies because we're not in the infancy stage of Bitcoin anymore. We're in the adolescent stage. It becomes adult hour when the gold backing is introduced. That's what I call game over. I mean, we're, we got so many situations, Elijah, that are game over. I mean, just add to, add to the mix the Russians and Chinese with respect to the Gulf Arabs and uh, pricing of oil and uh, payment methods for oil. This is uh, it's getting very dangerous right now for the dollar's, uh, uh, what do you call it, primary role among the currencies. And all the wars just make the uh, integrity of the dollar all that much lower. The dollar's not supported by military so much. It's supported by aggressive military action with war crimes. And that's a very tenuous situation for a, a, global, a global reserve currency. I'm actually hearing that deals were struck a year or two ago for the dollar to be phased out as a global currency reserve. Deals that the U.S. government signed on and never told anybody about. So these are dangerous and end games we're involved in right now i'd like to move on to this next viewer's question which is about the dollar you said in the past that you see the dollar rising and rising and then rising more and then finally collapsing this viewer is wanting to know why then right now is the dollar declining it seems like that's going against what you had said before okay let me be straight i have said this 20 times 
and I have been misquoted 20 times. I have said the following 20 times. The dollar will rise, rise, then rise some more, then vanish. I have never said it will decline. It will vanish. It will not decline. So when you're seeing the current situation with the dollar index going down and going below certain critical uh, support levels, I attribute this to one and only one thing. The stolen French election and the relief rally on the euro. Take a look at the components for the dollar index. It's about 52%, I don't know exactly, 56% right in there, the euro. It's a 30-year-old calculation that's anachronistic as possibly can be. So when the dollar is going down, it means the euro is going up. There was a lot of shorting for the euro currency going into the French election. There was other shorting going into the Brexit referendum. The French elect election was essentially a referendum on the French exit. So they had someone who was in favor of staying in the Union versus Le Pen, whose uh, votes were torn up uh, largely, and fake votes were put in, put in for Macron. It's Macron, but I, I, let's just call it Macron so people know what I'm talking about. Um, French was my second language. I, I actually got a junior year French award in high school out of 200 kids. So the way you pronounce it is Emmanuel Macron. Okay, Macron won the rigged, farcical, corrupt election. Uh, just as a quick aside, about a half a million fake votes were just put in without any voter involved. They just put in there as, as ballots with a check mark for Macron. Okay, now we got those votes. They were all stolen. Uh, they tore up something like 30 or 40 percent, <clears throat> damaged the ballots for Marine Le Pen, and uh, no one seems to give a shit. So they stole it fair and square. That's the old American phrase. When the election was declared a victory for Macron, the euro started rising and all the shorts started to cover. In response, the dollar index went down. So it's the, do the, the DX dollar index is, in my opinion, nothing more than an anti-euro index. <clears throat> so let's see what comes next. Uh, when the euro levels off, and the short covering is finished, you're likely to see the dollar have a bounce. I have never said it will decline in a big way like a crash. Just take a look at some of the past YouTubes. I have never said it's going to crash. On 10 different occasions, I've corrected people who have misquoted me, and they continue to misquote me because I don't think they understand the concept of vanishing. It vanishes the dollar in trade payment methods when, say, the gold trade note comes into play. It takes severe lumps in its integrity, the dollar that is, when the gold-backed cryptos come to the table. That's how it vanishes. It doesn't decline. It vanishes. It goes away. The whole East Hemisphere will declare we're not using the dollar for our banking reserves anymore. The dollar is not a legitimate global currency reserve, which means two things. Not gonna be used in banking core assets, not gonna be used for trade payments. Now I get, I get some flack once in a while, like yesterday, some guy called me an idiot in my contact us box. And you know, like a brave soul, he puts no return email or a phony email address. But he said, Jim, you don't know shit. Uh, trade payments are not done in treasury bills. They're done in letters of credit. And of course, letters of credit written in the dollar paid with treasury bills. You know, I, I can't even reply to these idiots because they misquote me. They say something stupid and they don't put a return email. <clears throat> I hope that answers the question. 
it's going to be a very strange sequence of events when the dollar loses its global currency reserve status and and that means in trade and banking in trade and banking it, it suffers the loss which means if a country wants to buy a, a tanker of crude oil like China they're going to pay in RMB or they're going to pay in that's their currency, Chinese currency, or they're going to pay in a in another clever form like a gold trade note with a gold backing of a cryptocurrency. That means the dollar is just pushed to the side. Now, yeah, there might be some decline involved in that, but I think it's just going to stop being used by a large section of the globe, of many, many different nations within the community of nations. They're not going to use it. Now, turn to the banking. If they don't want to use the treasury bond anymore in their banking reserves, you know, their capital reserves and maintaining the ratios and all this stuff with, uh, you know, credit extended within a country's economy by their central bank, they're going to dump their treasuries and buy gold. Okay, that could bring about some decline in the dollar, but I believe what you're going to see in the next, I don't know how many years, a couple of years, half a year, I don't know, two and a half years, I don't know if they're going to create a few more new wars to defend the dollar, complete with war crimes, as we always do. But <clears throat> I'm guessing that the Federal Reserve and the Department of Treasury are going to lap them up. Whatever's dumped, they're going to lap them up to try to maintain the value of the dollar, and they're going to eventually be overwhelmed, and they're going to say, we're not going to even post the dollar price anymore. It's all going to be done in the background. If you people across the world don't want to use treasury bonds as your core reserves for banking, then we'll do these private deals. There'll be some discounting, and we're not going to report the dollar's value anymore. We're not going to report the treasury bond's value anymore. That's what I mean by vanish. Definitely, and I realize actually that was uh, my fault there. I was the idiot there. I... Um misinterpreted the question and the viewer actually did uh, say why is it not going higher before it vanished so I was the one who uh, misphrased the question oh, that, that's okay Elijah don't don't worry about it because 90% of the people who bring about that quote from my work don't quote it correctly right and it, it is an important distinction there but between just vanishing going away and actually declining so um, yeah. I really do appreciate the clarification there now moving on here to uh, precious metals this viewer is wanting to know what is your opinion on the restrictions one faces when trying to sell physical precious metals and they're wanting to know if you wanted to share any personal testimony that when trying to sell precious metals if you've had any kind of problems like are there a lot of restrictions like you have to fill out a lot of forms are there like max limits on how much you can sell um, if, or if you just have any knowledge about this and do you think the increasing restrictions there are is kind of making people shy away from trying to invest in physical precious metals. I actually hear far more. I don't talk about personal experiences ever. Uh, it's, it's not a, a wise practice. What I have learned is it's far more cumbersome with restrictions and paperwork to purchase. Now that we've got you know, several years of suppressed prices for gold and silver, there's a whole lot more initiative out there for the followers to buy. You don't try to sell with you know earnest urgency at these ridiculously low prices. You, te you try to buy. Uh, and there are a lot of restrictions and obstacles that I hear about uh, for legitimate attempts to purchase gold coins, silver coins, for all the paperwork. <clears throat> the paperwork appears to be in sync with admission of terrorism activities, uh, like opposing the government, the little, little wording in there, uh, source of funds. When you buy a house, you don't have to fill out forms for your source of funds. If you buy a car, you don't have to fill out forms for source of funds. If you want to buy artwork, <clears throat> You want to buy some expensive uh, room additions, build a swimming pool. You don't have to fill out forms 
for origin of funds. So there is a direct assault against the demand for gold and silver. Uh, it's not seen in any other market, well, except for maybe explosives. But I don't want to go there. As for restrictions on selling, <clears throat> I, I don't know that there are very many restrictions. There, there are just forms on, you know, taxable events, taxable event for profit, I mean. But uh, really, how many people have a lot of profit in the last couple of years from selling gold coins? Uh, I've got a couple of clients who say, Jim, I'm, I'm in a bad spot for the last four years, three years, two years. I've had to sell every couple of months a few coins to cover living expenses, and I don't like it. And all I say to them is that's unfortunate that you haven't maintained income in order to stay on the sidelines for having to sell anything. And they say, yeah, well, you know, things happen. And things do happen. <clears throat> I'm fortunate that uh, I have pretty steady newsletter income. Uh, and I, I will admit, it's not as much as it was a year or two ago. Uh, it, it is in slight decline. And uh, I attribute it to both the suppressed gold price, you know, precious metals prices, and to a unbelievably wretched economy that is not in any way, shape, or form in a sluggish recovery mode. I think we're approaching a collapse scenario for the U.S. economy. And if it was in a recovery mode, how come we had a thousand store closings so far this year? It's because the consumption model has contributed mightily to killing the U.S. economy. We're so stupid as a nation of economic uh, guidance, we still stick to the stupidity of the consumption model as opposed to the investment model. Why did China have a huge burst in the last 10 to 15 years in growth? Because they weren't necessarily encouraging spending. They were encouraging business investment, hiring. U.S. brain trust, they've gone moronic. We, we don't even know what capitalism is. We don't know how to create wealth except through a printing press. We don't know how to spread income around except through food stamps and, and just the national dole, welfare. We're, we're a stupid country in our leadership right now. We don't know how to build businesses. Look at what happened with Trump. He had a plan for an annual trillion dollar infrastructure uh, build out. And what have we gotten instead? We got a hundred billion, three hundred billion dollar Saudi arms deal instead. We're not following through in business investment. The Congress does not encourage it. The Congress encourages the Obama tax, uh, stimulus plan, not, not tax, but stimulus plan. It's handouts. We don't know how to create jobs. We know how to create new handouts. Look what happened after 9-11. Bush, too, announced he wanted people to go out and spend. And Greenspan said, we want people to go out and borrow against their homes so they can spend. There's no mindset toward building businesses. We have huge obstructions to building new businesses. It's called high federal regulations, highest in the world for corporate income tax, workman compensation, which is, you know, it sounds like a very good thing, except if it goes too far, it inhibits business. And I ask a very basic question about the Saudi arms deal. And you can, you can follow up on this later in the interview, or you can leave it alone. The Saudis are issuing bonds to cover their huge deficits as a result of their own problems from a lower oil price and problems from extreme expenses with the Yemen war. So if they're issuing bonds for the first time in their 50 year history, how on earth are they paying for $110 billion worth of arms? They're not. The whole story is a lie. And I have my opinions. We could follow up later if you wish, but uh, I'll just leave it there. All right, I'd like to move now to this next viewer's question about the Shanghai Gold Exchange. Now, he's wanting to know, 
What's up with the Shanghai Gold Exchange? I thought it was supposed to have a bigger impact on gold prices. Yeah, me too. Me too. Uh, we did not see the arbitrage that was expected. Here's what I mean by that. We did not see the higher gold price in Shanghai of more than, say, a couple or three percent versus the London and New York price. We just didn't see it, which means the Chinese could not execute on their plan or they chose not to. Okay, there's a, an old joke that's been running around for the last three to five years to answer the question, when is the gold price going to take off and move up, up, up? The answer with the joke is when China wants it to. So I had a two-sided there. Shanghai Gold Exchange resulted in the Chinese unable or unwilling to let, the to let the gold price run up, up, up. I believe they're still busy converting their trillion dollars in treasury bonds into gold bullion. Not just gold bullion, but, you know, massive infrastructure projects, uh, not just in China, but in uh, say, Southeast Asia, the entire Pacific Rim, and now this One Belt, One Road. When people are reading about this One Belt, One Road, uh, it's like a tabletop cornucopia of projects, all of them multi-billion, almost all. I ask the question, where's the funding for that? I mean, this is how I distinguish myself from a lot of different analysts, maybe not a lot, lot maybe some analysts, they think, oh, this is going to be great. But they don't ask the question, where's the funding going to come from? I think it's going to come off the U.S. Treasury bond pile held by China. So for two reasons, China wants to keep things going. So they can acquire more discounted gold and silver. And so they can use their Treasury bonds at full value for the infrastructure build out for the entire Eurasian trade zone. What's in it for China to say, okay, let's pull the plug on this, and hey, you know, so we lose $700 billion in write-downs for the treasury bonds. Who in his right mind wants to just throw away $700, $800 billion in treasury bonds from a default? Who wants to bring about a default in his own balance sheet? That's just doesn't have any thinking behind it at all. So the Chinese are still interested in maintaining the system and have a little side game going where it looks very clear that JP Morgan was hired by the Chinese to keep the silver price down and to acquire truckloads and boatloads of silver for replenishing the Chinese silver stockpile. What's in it for China to wreck the dollar? Nothing. Nothing. So, well, except, well, I shouldn't say nothing. I'm just being a little bit uh, silly passionate here. The Chinese want a legitimate monetary system. They don't want their banking system to, to collapse. They don't want the, the Eurasian corner of the world to suffer the consequences of a dollar collapse. But they've got an, an ulterior motive to continue to acquire gold and silver and to continue to use their treasury bills, treasury bonds and bills, for paying for big construction projects, including the pipeline to Russia for oil and gas. China doesn't want to throw that away. So they're, they're playing a very delicate game. And, and they also, I hear this from The Voice frequently, <clears throat> the Chinese and Russians do not want to be the blame for the dollar's failure. They want it to fail on its own lack of merit. And I think that makes a great deal of sense. The Chinese want, you know, 10 years from now to be able to say, your dollar failed because you wrecked it, because you engaged in wars, because you printed trillions in it every month in secrecy because you cannot find a buyer for your own national debt financed in the form of a securitized treasury bond. They'd much prefer to say, 
you killed your own dollar. Don't blame us. History will be our witness. So here's what I think, going, going back to the SGE, and uh, now you got to bring in the Hong Kong exchange. <clears throat> I heard from some very savvy clients recently that the Shanghai Gold Exchange was not enough. I mean, just put aside all the motives to delay and to continue to acquire precious metals and continue to use treasure bonds and contracts. Put that aside for now. It could be the Chinese could not do it with the Shanghai Gold Exchange alone. Think of it this way. The Chinese are like a big guy, big man. One foot standing in the golden pond of Shanghai. Now they have another golden pond within much of their control in Hong Kong. So they have an inside China and outside China leg in the gold market, and they're much better in position to conduct arbitrage and take advantage of price differentials east versus west. Furthermore, Hong Kong has always been a main conduit for gold coming into China. It's like you couldn't send in a bunch of gold into Shanghai without going through Hong Kong. That's very interesting. Now, mixed in with the potential for arbitrage, you have significant, say, Australian gold supply going in to Hong Kong. That might now be used in the arbitrage without having it well known that it's being used in the arbitrage. In other words, Hong Kong has got a very busy traffic terminal, and a lot of stuff can go on without being fully recognized as going on. This is very important. Um, furthermore, the Hong Kong exchange is, uh, they're the owner of the London Metal Exchange, which I believe before long is going to have some very friendly gold contracts they're going to be taken advantage of by the Easterners, like the Asians. The Hong Kong exchange, like the Shanghai exchange, are going to be selling Chinese currency settlement for physically delivered gold. Furthermore, Shanghai has announced in the next few months they're going to have an RMB denominated oil contract. So we have a convergence of oil and gold on the RMB highway. This, I think, will lead to the evolution of the gold trade note used for Chinese oil purchases. It will link gold with oil in RMB settled oil contracts. Oil is important because it's the most, it has the highest volume for its transactions in international commerce. Whatever oil evolves into for its payment systems will dictate what's going on in global trade. By that I mean purchases of grain, cement, timber, international contracts, say for consulting. And, and Euroraj gave a great example. He said the Indians provide IT support for a healthcare system in Saudi Arabia. Okay, paid in dollars right now, treasury bills. If that ever moves to something else, it might be on the tail of the Chinese paying for their Gulf region oil from the Arabs in RMB or in a gold trade note. I think we're going to see a convergence of the uh, gold trade note with the RMB currency. They might be interchangeable at some point. And that will be a pseudo gold backed RMB. Very interesting because most, most currencies are traded in the form of a bond or bill. A bill is just a shorter term note, like, you know, two years or less. A bond is 10 years or more. And uh, <clears throat> that's how the distinction comes for the, the new currency. A gold trade note would remove the treasury bill short term for trade payment. But I don't know how except for an actual gold bond, like a Chinese government bond payable in gold, 
or a certain percentage like a cover clause paid in gold. That is the device, the vehicle that would push out the treasury bond in banking systems. So again, the, the global currency reserve has two sides to it. Trade payment in shorter term notes, bills, and a longer term version, which would be used as a banking asset. Uh, you don't put gold bars in a banking reserve system in your vaults in order to produce income. You do it to remove the potential of an entire national bankruptcy situation, like what you're seeing in Italy. So I hope that answers the question. I, I really do believe the, the new Hong Kong gold exchange is going to be a game changer and a gold market killer. Uh, they're trying to make sure that the hours of activity coincide with the New York gold fix. They're going to try to take control of the New York gold fix from actual market equilibrium activity in Hong Kong. This is very, very big. And, and as soon as you see the London, the London Metal Exchange uh, come up with a, a, gold, uh, a gold futures contract that's deliverable, you can, you can just start the countdown. The gold market's going to have a failure. Uh, let me mention something regarding the gold market that uh, is quite important. Harvey Organ came out with a, uh, a news brief and analysis report recently saying that more than a few uh, New York-based gold futures contracts standing for delivery were given a petition letter by the COMEX <clears throat> that used the word urgency for their consideration to accept a cash settlement instead of the metal. The first time they ever used the word emergency, they often just threaten in, in words like, uh, if you intend to become a continued participant in the COMEX, you'll take your cash settlement. So a, th a threat has moved into an appeal with urgency. That is a very big deal. So we'll see how it plays out next month. But the June delivery, since the month is divisible by three, is very important. We may not get another urgent situation until we're in September. The next, uh, I, think, I don't know what they call it, a controlling contract, the, the, major, the major contract, um, every three months. So interesting times, interesting pressures, and uh, we have some very extraordinary situations that are building up right now, Elijah. All right, and before we let you go, we had one last viewer's question about the current situation with the Gulf states' sudden blockade of Qatar. They're just wondering uh, what your perspective is on this. Okay, regarding the Gulf states, I don't know of any physical blockade, but what I am hearing about is a, uh, a boycott of commerce. So it's not so much ships blocking passage as it is, we're not going to do business with you. We're going to have you isolated, Qatar. I think they call it Qatar. I like calling it Qatar. I can call it whatever I want. Uh, there is a big dispute going on regarding certain Gulf Arab nations for participating with Iran. Uh, the Saudis are at, you know, just ri ridiculous levels of conflict by words and conflict by by hot war with the Iranians. The Saudis are not going to be able to handle Iran. They haven't yet in Yemen and they're not going to. It's so bad in Yemen for the Saudis that they're now having hot battles like at the Aden airport with the UAE. So their neighbors are becoming their enemies inside Yemen, the war within the war. Okay, so a number of Gulf Arab states have either signed or have head nods or handshakes with the Iranians to bring about more peaceful environment in the entire Gulf region. And that really pisses off the Saudis because they want war. They're a satellite slave state 
of the United States and Great Britain, UK. And they follow the orders of their American Anglo-American masters, which means go fight a new war. Don't worry, we'll cover the press the, the press citations and we'll call it a sectarian violence. No, it's not anything like that. It's, Yemen's not about Sunni versus Shiite, a division of the Muslim. No, not at all. It's about the Saudis having lied for 10 years about their, about their uh, uh, spare capacity and reserves, reserve oil fields. They're almost completely out. So they're trying to sell Aramco because there's not much more oil to process. They're trying to sell 10% of Aramco in a grotesquely overpriced initial, pu initial public offering for their stock. I've seen reports that, that indicate just based on competent, regular, normal price analysis of IPOs, Compare it to Exxon, compare it to Gulf, uh, well, we got Royal Dutch Shell, compare it to uh, Rosneft of Russia, and you come up with the same conclusion. Aramco's overpriced by a factor of four or five. So why are the Saudis trying to sell it at a ridiculous price? Because they've lost their, they've lost their, uh, their oil reserves. They don't have much. They got tremendous depletion after years and years, 30 years of Gawar. Gawar is pumping 98% water. They're not pumping oil. I mean, their big issue there is how do we get the, the oil out of the water? I mean, it's separation methods. Okay, so Qatar is being isolated now by the uh, most of the Gulf Arabs. And I don't know exactly what they claim the offense to be. We're hearing that it's buddying up to the Iranians to, to try to bring about more stable environment in the Gulf region. I got my other opinions. Qatar is a main investor, and they're pulling out of Deutsche Bank. Qatar is a recipient of a couple billion dollars from Clinton Foundation's stolen money. They just pull the money out and stick it in Qatar, and I think the Clintons believe that they can have safe passage for hiding out, refuge, they're buying a refuge. <clears throat> Qatar is also very involved with Gazprom of Russia in LNG facilities. So maybe the other Gulf Arabs don't like some of these activities and are pointing to the buddying up, partnering with the Iranians. I don't know. We're never given the full scoop we're never given the true story. We have to figure it out. And that's what the Hattrick letter is all about, figuring out these things through inference, through, well, if that were true, we wouldn't see this. If it were true, we'd see the following, and we are. So, you know, that that's simplistic, but that's kind of how some of the thinking goes on toward making conclusions with incomplete and falsified information. And if viewers would like to find you online, did you want to share with the viewers um, your website and also how they can subscribe to your newsletter? Sure. If you go to goldenjackass.com, www.goldenjackass.com, you find uh, a public page. It in includes a lot of radio shows like this. I try to repeat with hosts only if they allow the interview to be posted even with some delay. Uh, there's public articles that are on the way, main web webpage. Um, once people are more familiar, or if they're already quite familiar and, and they are somewhat impressed by the quality, I hope they sign up for the newsletter. <clears throat> the newsletter has two parts each month. I should say there are two posted reports each month. One is called the Global Money War Report. And that focuses on high-level things like defense of the dollar, uh, use of war to defend the dollar, blockage of Gazprom uh, for provision to Western Europe in energy supply, uh, the Eurasian trade zone, and, and other issues like that. I put in the second report that, that is focused more on petrodollar issues and gold and, gold and silver supply and demand, mint, mint activity. The second report is called the Gold and Currency Report. So one is a high-level report, one is a more ground-level report uh, for activity, and uh, a 
couple of months ago had the 13th anniversary. Uh, very pleased at the, uh, the progress and evolution of the newsletter. We're, we're getting into some very dangerous times now. It honestly has me quite worried. Uh, I haven't really slept too well since Lehman in 2008, but uh, I will say that the combination of the U Ukraine war and the Syrian war and now the Yemen war um, have me very concerned have me very uneasy and uh, I'm, I'm just afraid of conflagration but I don't think conflagration I'm talking about nuclear war uh, I don't think conflagration is going to happen I think cooler heads will prevail and even when the totally insane and psychotic neocons are at work they will be restrained because the d decision will have to be made do we want to follow through on the plans of these neocons if it means to destroy the United States and turn it into a cinder? I think the answer will be no, we're not going to do that, so let's push out the neocons. The pushing out of the neocons is not simple, and the Trump election is not pushing out the neocons. What it's doing is bringing about tremendous conflict within the neocon chambers. So it's bringing about a division within the neocons. We're going to start hearing phrases like a good neocon and a bad neocon, uh, a positive neocon and a, and a warmonger uh, neocon. I, I, I hate them all. I hate them all because they're illogical, they're destructive, they're menacing, they're violent, and they never tell the truth. They never tell the truth. They, they decide on which nation to attack and suck the blood out of. Like in Yemen, they're trying to steal the untapped, huge oil and gas reserves. It's a neighbor country to the Saudis. And, you know, I, I swear, 80% of Americans have no idea what, what Yemen is, no idea where it's located on the map, and no idea that it controls access to the Suez Canal for movement of ships to Europe. Uh, yet it's a very important little country, and it's under siege. And what's on the other side <clears throat> of the Gulf of Aden, on the other side of Yemen? It's Djibouti, where the Chinese control that African port. So you have the U.S. and Saudis at Aden, and you have the Chinese and the Africans on the other side, the African side, for control of the Suez Canal up north. Americans don't have any concept at all of, of these things. And uh, it's not in the American news either. The U.S. doesn't have news coverage of Yemen. They just say, well, heavy, heavy battling between sectarian groups in opposition. Yeah, that's the, the knucklehead crap that we're told. I don't buy it for a minute. I don't listen to it for a minute. People ask me sometimes, what do you make of the news stories about blah, blah, blah? And I say, I don't know. I don't watch the stupid spoon-fed nonsense bullshit that comes out of CNN or any of the major U.S. news networks. All right, so that's my little speech on uh, closing points, and I appreciate you having me on, and appreciate your tolerating my my last stage sickness here. I'm, boy, I need to get over this. Need to get over this this flu with uh, bronchial infection. It's it's very nasty, but I. Get my energy back, and slowly I think I'll get, be I'll get better. All right, well, appeared to one year ago. My goal is to continue running my independent media outlet and create even more quality content. So I've created a Patreon account. If you'd like to become a supporter, simply make a pledge. Once we reach our $2,000 a month goal, I will create an exclusive podcast featuring one of you. Yes, I will be interviewing one Patreon subscriber per month and let them tell their own story of how they woke up to the reality of our fraudulent financial system and the importance of owning sound money. I want to build a community of like-minded individuals. If you can make a monetary pledge to help Finance and Liberty, then awesome. Go to patreon.com slash finance and liberty and pledge as little as $1 per month. I understand that not everyone can pay for extra content, and I want to make the community open to everyone. So I will be sending out the special monthly podcasts in the Finance and Liberty free newsletter as well. 
So if you don't have any funds to pledge, simply go to financeandliberty.com or click here to sign up for the Finance and Liberty newsletter. Hey everyone, this is Elijah Johnson with financeandliberty.com and back with us today is Dr. Jim Willie, editor of the Hattrick Letter found on goldenjackass.com. Jim, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, it's a pleasure being here. I uh, I have to caution people that I'm I'm getting over a, a pretty nasty flu with some lung congestion and problems there, a lot of coughing. And uh, please bear with me, though. There'll, there'll be some breaks where I have to cough, and that's the way it is right now, and I'm trying to get over this. It's been over a week. I had viewers submit questions today, and the first couple viewers' questions are on Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies because we've seen them just people just piling into Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies recently. Bitcoin, you know, around all time highs. And this viewer is wanting to know if you agree with Rob Kirby that the strong increase in cryptocurrencies and, you know, the rush into Bitcoin represents the final demise of fiat currencies, particularly the dollar. Yes, I do. I agree with that assessment. Um, I think it's I don't think that adequately summarizes all of Rob's thoughts on that matter. Uh, let me add to to his point. <clears throat> to begin with, the Bitcoin, but there's there's more to this. Um, I don't. Okay, I've got some problems with the Bitcoin and the cryptos. I got here's my biggest problem, Elijah, and that is what is the actual Step. What is the procedure for creating, say, a Bitcoin? I'm not really sure about that. Uh, I also wonder what is the exact type of unit <clears throat> for a Bitcoin. What is it? And all I can hear, of it, all I can, all I hear, all I can comprehend is that it's a unit of electronic work. But it seems to be paid in paper fiat currency, like a dollar. Okay, so <clears throat> why is this seeming close-end fund running up so much? It's because it's got limited supply, for which I don't comprehend fully, and rising demand, which is pushing its price up, up, up. All right, here's the big question for the day regarding cryptos. Are the powers that be like the Wall Street banks and central banks, London banks, and key Western European banks, are they making an agreement to let Bitcoin and others rise, 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 so that <clears throat> they will be vulnerable? Because one question I keep having a great deal of difficulty getting a good answer for is, what's the relationship between Bitcoin and gold? And all I can comprehend is none. None at all. Um, so I don't know how it's mined. I don't know how the supply comes. And I don't know what its basis is. And it's, I know it's not related to gold. So what the hell is it? I don't know exactly. I'm honest about this. So I don't know what this is exactly all about, except that it seems like, given its closed-end nature, like a closed-end fund, the powers that be might be allowing it to rise so that they can slam it and smash it with the first introduction of a gold-backed cryptocurrency. China's talking about it. <clears throat> the Fed is talking about it with, I think, Fedcoin. Mine seems to be the flagship that is running uh, front and center among all the cryptocurrencies. Uh, it, it uses the blockchain encryption technology, uh, which I believe will become more important in other ways, now, I mean more important than, than you know, funds transactions, funds movement, but the blockchain is going to become extremely important for business-to-business -business communications. Like, for instance, I'll get back to Rob's point, but I, this is a very important issue: the blockchain. If companies want to send, say, uh, schematics on a product design or you know, rather detailed description of, of characteristics of a new product. 
uh, this is very sensitive, and they will do it with the encryption of blockchain. If they want to send uh, to another company, like interested in an acquisition, uh, a lot of information, say, for future strategy, one-year plan and three-year plan. Uh, it's very sensitive, and they'll transmit it by means of blockchain. If they want to send uh, other information like, say, stock options and uh, planned uh, personnel changes, uh, planned uh, contracts for consultants, and other sensitive information, one company to another, they'll use blockchain. If they want to, use, if they want to move across, uh, say, uh, titles for property and uh, bids and things like that. Uh, the plot plans of properties, whether they're small or large. They'll be doing it with blockchain. So we're, we're moving now to an area where not just sensitive funds movement to be done in a secure way, like with Bitcoin, it'll be for a movement of very important, uh, you know, kind of classified information at the corporate level. Okay. When Rob mentions that this is uh, the final... Uh, step final phase for the dollar I agree completely and uh, almost everybody on my little jackass gang of colleagues feels pretty much the same way be very much central to the gold trade note which kills the dollar and the Treasury bill for a trade payment potential that's how important this is going to be when you get your first entry of a gold backed cryptocurrency it can then be immediately used in trade payment and that's when the Treasury bill will just go to the wayside and it'll grow and grow and grow because they'll know that the unit of payment is real whereas the unit of a Treasury bill is bullshit the US and the Fed are printing I believe very firmly three to ten trillion dollars a month not the advertised 40 60 80 billion a month they're printing tremendous amounts in the trillions every month to cover their derivative books to make sure the interest rate swap derivative is active and prevents a Treasury bond default because there are almost no buyers and there's a trillion to maybe trillion and a half every year due for federal and federal deficit and trade deficit. The public numbers on central bank participation for uh, uh, QE, they're absolute nonsense and lies. They're off by a factor of 10, 15, or 20. So I'm looking forward transition here slightly I'm looking forward to the day when we get some gold backing for cryptos because that will sort out the mom and pop cryptos from the legitimate ones and I'm coming to learn from some uh, some of my minor study that one of the biggest issues regarding a valid cryptocurrency is its efficiency in usage and they're not all the same some might have half the amount of energy, uh, what's the word, consumed or used in order to facilitate from end to end, point to point, a transaction. And the ones that do it more efficiently, not exactly sure about the gold basis of that. Uh, and there are other entries that might become gold back. So if they let the Bitcoin group go up, 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 and then there's an introduction of a gold-backed Bitcoin type. I think we're going to see a rather significant decline in the crypto values. Uh, and I'm not really sure how the value of a crypto is determined. So we're, we're dealing with you know, very murky, competitive type of currency, uh, which has secure transferability. One of the biggest things the central bank crowd hates about Bitcoin is its transferability across international lines completely out of the purview of the banking system of SWIFT and you know the Federal Reserve monitoring 
of, of such. So we've got the evolution and development of something that's very counteractive uh, to the currency system right now. And they don't like it a bit. You know, that play on words for Bitcoin, but they don't like it at all. It, it's out of their control. So I think they're going to try to smash it somehow. But I think they're going to fail. Um, the big, the big event coming is introduction of gold-backed cryptocurrencies, where there will no longer be a question: Well, what is its unit of value? And you won't say a unit of electronic work. You'll say. It's a gold coin with some associated work related to that. <clears throat> the voice has an opinion on this. You know, he, he's, uh, he's kind of old school when it comes to money. He believes in gold and not in paper. But Bitcoin is uh, it's taking the world by storm. And it's not a phony unit. And it's a very reliable transferability method. But the voice believes very clearly that blockchain technology, which is the gut of Bitcoin, will